Okay, so uh, let me continue. Okay, first of all, thanks to Dave and the organizer to giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. And uh, thank you in advance for taking the time to listen to me and for your attention. My name is Eleonora Secchi and today I will present you my work on how flow influence bacteria surface colonization. Basically, 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water and 60% on average of our body mass is constituted by water. It's the percentage is even higher in some organs. Then if you count the number of prokaryote cells on Earth, they are about one times 10 to the 30. And uh, in the human body, cells are as many as eukaryotic cells. So basically, we live in a microbial aqueous planet and we are microbial aqueous creature. And uh, <clears throat> some of the bacteria uh, can be found in the planktonic state that are like free living lifestyle in uh, basically the one that was studied in bulk so far. Uh, while the most uh, like um, adopted lifestyle is the surface attached. And when they are in the surface attached lifestyle, they form biofilms. Biofilms are defined as aggregates of bacteria in which cells are embedded in a self-secreted extracellular polymeric matrix. Tend to the protection conferred by the matrix against chemical and mechanical insults, Biofilms are one of the most widely distributed modes of life on Earth. They can be found find in the natural environment, in the human body, and in the technological setting, where in pipes or membranes. And uh, <clears throat> basically, all these environments are normally moist and characterized by the constant motion of water that influences both the chemical landscape and uh, exert forces on the microorganism and on the biofilm. So when they develop in every environment, especially in flow, they go from a free floating planktonic states, then they land on the surface and then they start to attach. And then they go in like different stages from initial to mature biofilm and then at the end the mature biofilm disperses. The initial attachment is quite a simple phase in the formation of the biofilm but it's really really important because the bacterial behavior during this phase determines the structure of the mature biofilm. We have two examples here. The first one is like a study uh, of a few years ago in uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa PA14, where cells moving on the surface were like studied first in terms of their motion, and then where they had been, which part of the surface they had visited was correlated with the um, polysaccharide, polysaccharide called PSL, trails were released. And they saw that basically where bacteria were moving, PSL was released. And also this PSL was attracting other cells, creating preferential attachment site. In addition, the biofilm matrix, so the polysaccharide, confers mechanical resistance to the, to the biofilm. So uh, in this case, biofilms before and after uh, an air bubble was trying to disrupt them were studied. This is an early stage biofilm. And what we can see is that after a bubble passes on the biofilm, a characteristic pattern is developed and this like pattern where the cell remain on the surface can be correlated one-to-one -one where APS is released. And so we can really see that how cell behave on the surface at the beginning will create the structure for the resisting biofilm. But like we said that Flow is ubiquitous and a lot of systems are in flow. And so it's na quite natural asking what is the impact of flow on surface colonization? 
close to a surface, bacteria encounter a quite peculiar hydrodynamic environment due to the fact that they find themselves in a shear profile because uh, velocity varies quite a lot close to a surface. And these uh, uh, shear exert a torque which can rotate them. Uh, so fluid flow can shape, can enhance the colonization, for example, with the interaction with the shape of the bacterium. This example is quite peculiar and is Colucobacter crescentius. And uh, it's like this bacteria that has a stalk is attached to the surface and then thanks, thanks to its banana shape, inflow just release the daughter cells on the surface, making them very, very uh, efficient in colonizing the surface. Um, then the hydrodynamic interaction which, uh, with the surface, which in quiescent condition uh, can attract and trap swimming bacteria at the surface, when we have a fluid uh, flow, uh, these, uh, type, the same type of interaction can trigger bacterial motion in the direction opposite to this flow. And so basically we can have two phenomena. One is the upstream swimming where flagellated elongated bacteria like E. coli and B. subtilis swim quite fast, like few micrometer per second uh, in the direction opposite to the flow and so colonize uh, uh, parts of the flow network that would be forbidden to them, uh, or uh, bacteria having pilis, like for example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Xylella fastidiosa, can uh, do another similar mechanism that is upstream twitching. And again, with the same mechanism, they can move upstream. This is upstream twitching is a bit slower, uh, however, quite efficient in the colonization. When we have um, a curved surface, the mechanism driving upstream migration can lead to the accumulation past the obstacles. For example, we can see here what happens uh, past to a pillar flow in this case is, is in this direction and we see accumulation in the wake of the pillar. Or if we have a constriction, we can see more bacterial cells downstream than upstream. Both these uh, uh, mechanisms are due to the hydrodynamic interaction with the surface, and they are not in bulk. Now, if we move a bit away from the surface, then we have bacteria in a shear flow in bulk. And uh, if they are elongated like passive particle, they undergo periodic rotation called the Jeffrey orbits. And they are due to the fact that while the centroid of the bacterium moves following the flow line, the body rotates due to the torque exerted by the shear. Spherical bacteria just rotate around the center of mass, while uh, um, elongated shape rotate more rapidly when they are um, oriented transverse to the flow and more slowly when they are aligned with the flow. So in this case, we can really see this type of tumbling motion that was measured, for example, in this case with the E. coli. Now, if we have this type of motion with motile organism, the preferential alignment can have a strong and rapid effect on the spatial distribution of the bacteria in the flow profile. This was shown a few years ago with a microfluidic experiment by Rusconi and uh, colleagues. And basically in this experiment, there is a bacillus subtilis suspension in flow in a microfluidic channel where we have a poisonous flow profile in the observation plane. Bacteria traveling, initially they are evenly distributed and then while traveling, they gradually accumulate close to the wall in the low velocity eye shear region. And this uh, depletion can be up to 70%. And so, it can have a very strong impact on the bacterial distribution. If we try to do the same with dead cells, we don't see anything. And so this points out to the fact that the accumulation is uh, an interplay between flow and cell motility. This mechanism, which was uh, named the shear trapping, uh, was also modeled 
as we can see here, the red thick line are experiment and the red thin line is the model. And in, in the model, basically that is a lunch van model of cell motility in flow, uh, bacteria are considered at self-propelled rigid rod with a certain elongation Q and uh, a swimming speed V directed along the main axis of the cell body. We have to stress that the elongation keeps into account both the cell body and the flagellar bundle. Uh, so this is the hydrodynamic resistance of the two combined. And then cell equation of motion can be written in the parabolic profile that is measured experimentally in the channel. Um, basically, this effect can have two very important, can have direct consequences on, on important microbial function. For example, it can hamper chemotaxis or talking about uh, surface colonization, it can increase it quite deeply because we will find more cell close to the wall and so the encounter rate with the wall will be increased. And as we can see here in this experiment that was done with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and uh, having several channel in parallel, shear was buried. At increasing shear, basically the uh, attachment was tripled. And so we can see that this effect was really, really important. Now, here we were dealing with a very simple straight geometry. But what happens is if we have a geometrically complex environment with curved surfaces involved? Starting from this question, we uh, designed a microfluidic platform containing pillars with different dimensions that are really far both from each other and from the walls. So they can really be considered isolated pillars in flow. And uh, we have like different dimension and then thanks to the precision allowed by microfluidic, we can easily vary the flow velocity and we have several channels in parallel to minimize the biological variability between different experiments. As shown here with console simulation, flow field around an isolated pillar has a windward and a leeward a stagnation region and a really high shear region close to the side. So from now on, we will talk a lot about the windward and the leeward region. Windward is the one facing the flow, leeward is the one from the opposite side. And we will mainly work with the suspension of Pseudomonas aeruginosa PA14. So if we first start with the polystyrene passive particle of the same dimension of the bacteria we will use, we see that basically they move following the streamlines. This is not a surprise because uh, uh, it was very well studied in the 70s uh, by in the literature of filtration. And what was concluded is that in order to have a capture, uh, a particle has to be moving on a streamline which will bring it in contact with the pillar. And the capture will happen only in the windward side. Now I will show you what happens if we flow a suspension of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We can see that the cell highlighted in white follow really offbeat trajectory and end up in the forbidden leeward side. So if we just follow some cells, we see that these trajectories, while these cells, while crossing the eye shear lateral region, which is here, are bent towards the back side, the leeward side of the pillar. This is due to the fact that shear induces bacteria to rotate with the angular velocity of the flow. And then after the rotation, they find themselves in the leeward stagnation point that is here, pointing aligned with the streamlines, and they can be pointing upstream or downstream. If they are motile and pointing downstream, they will just move away from the pillar, while if they point upstream, they will swim here and then reach the leeward side of the pillar. This was also seen in a numerical simulation where again we can see how the cell is bent. We can also see in blue in the experiment and in gray in the simulation that some cells are not interacting with flow and they just follow the streamlines. In this case 
the gray cell in the model were non-motile. And we can see that, okay, the cell is rotated, but then the rotation is inconsequential because they cannot swim and reach the leeward side. So few details about the model. We, uh, as in the work by Rusconi, we use the Allangevin model of cell motility in flow. Basically the equation are the same, but this time the flow profile is a bit more complex because we have a pillar. And so just the equation look a bit more complex than before. But again, bacteria are modeled as self-propelled rods and we measured experimentally the parameter describing the bacteria. And then we consider walls as perfect as sober, and we neglect any cell wall interaction effect. And we obtain these trajectories. As you can see, basically the type of behavior that we observe are really similar to the one I've just shown you in the experimental movie. Some cell just go straight and follow the streamline, some other deviate, but without uh, ending up on the pillar and some other just end up on the pillar, just as the white cell in the previous movie. So uh, now, since experimentally we would like to measure the colonization, following each bacteria would be quite time consuming and then would not uh, uh, tell us which bacteria will then stay on the surface. So we decided to use the GFP labeled fluorescent bacteria and then look at the fluorescent signal that uh, is accumulated on the pillar due to the fact that bacteria attach there. And uh, these are few results. So first of all, we explored the role of motility. And we did that by comparing a motile strain of uh, PA14 wild type with two non-motile mutants, always fluorescent, one delta flagella and one delta motility. And we see two main differences if we compare these experiments, but also if we look at the simulation. We see a very um, big difference in attachment density and also one big difference in attachment distribution. So first of all, we consider the attachment density. And to do so, we integrate the intensity in an annulus surrounding the pillar surface, and we define this integrated intensity. As we can see, those images are more bright and the attachment intensity, integrated intensity, is like two orders of magnitude higher for motile bacteria than for non-motile. And now if we look at the attachment distribution, we see that in the motile strain, we have a leeward peak of attachment, while in the non-motile yellow strain, bacteria just end up in the windward side as expected for passive particles. So definitely we can say that motile bacteria colonize the pillar more efficiently and on the leeward side. So the reason why uh, we have a strong increase in bacterial capture promoted by motility was already reported for sinking sphere, uh, spheres in the work of Kjolbe, but is also valid for pillars. Basically, the mechanism of this enhanced capture can be easily explained if we look at the trajectories that of cells, the one in red, that will encounter the pillar. So as we can see, if a cell is non-motile, so it is in green, will just end up on the pillar if it's traveling in the streamlines that will bring her in touch with it. While if a cell is motile, can cross the streamline, and even if it's really distant from it initially, then will end up on the pillar anyway. Uh, however, this is true only if the swimming, uh, if the imposed velocity is comparable to the bacterial swimming speed. And we see that the difference between red, motile, and green, non-motile cell is gradually reduced, increasing the uh, velocity. Another way to uh, look at this effect and compare different uh, condition is defining the capture efficiency as the capture rate divided by the flux of bacteria passing through the cylinder. And we, can, we will also use a rescaled velocity, flow velocity, that is like the flow velocity divided by the bacterial swimming speed. And then we have a look at the experimental data. What we can see is that 
the capture efficiency is reduced at increasing imposed flow velocity, but doesn't show a very strong dependence on the pillar dimension. These trends are both uh, um, very well captured by the numerical simulation. But with the numerical simulation, we can go further and see that we have two different regimes. One regime at moderate flow, in which basically we see this decrease with increasing flow velocity and we don't see any dependence by the pillar diameter. And another regime in the strong flow, uh, where we see like a very weak dependence on imposed for flow velocity, and then a capture efficiency that is decreasing with increasing pillar diameter. And this is totally in line with what is observed with passive particle. So what it seems is that we are seeing a transition from an active regime with where flow velocity matters, um, where, sorry, uh, swimming speed matters to a passive regime where bacteria just behave as passive colloids. In order to confirm this, we can uh, plot uh, our capture efficiency as a function of the Peclet number, which provide a measure of the importance of transport by flow relative to transport by diffusion. And again, we see two regimes. One, in low Peclet, where the enhancement in capture efficiency is very evident and can be understood as like diffusing transport due to the swimming speed of the bacteria being more important than the transport velocity. And while we increase the flow rate, we see that the capture efficiency decreases because bacteria are like their diffusivity is less important. And at some point, we just end up in a passive regime at IPECLE number where basically just flow matters. And uh, bacteria at high flow speed and passive particles just behave the same. So we see really a transition from motile, uh, motile active re regime and a non-motile passive regime. This trend is confirmed in the experiment where we can see really the two regime and one ending up in the other. So, so far we have considered like the efficiency. Now we will look at how flow velocity affect the distribution of attachment around the pillar. So in moderate flow, we, have, we can see uh, if we look at the angular distribution of the attachment on the surface that we um, experimentally measure from the fluorescent intensity, uh, we can see that we have a very strong leeward peak. This leeward peak is even more pronounced if we increase a bit the velocity, but then it starts disappearing. And we see that the windward peak is more, uh, becomes more and more important until we are in a very strong flow and we just have a big windward peak and a teeny tiny leeward peak here. So the change in the distribution of attachment of motile bacteria with flow velocity can be quantified in terms of the standard deviation of the angular distribution normalized by the standard deviation of a uniform east distribution. If this uh, normalized standard deviation is higher than one, this denotes a distribution that is skewed towards the leeward side of the pillar, as we can see here in this point. While if we have just a windward uh, uh, peak, then the mm, normalized standard deviation will have a value lower than one, as we can see in this like, last point, experimental point that we could take. Again, leeward attachment is present only at flow velocity that are comparable to the bacterial swimming speed. Again, considering the simulation, we can have a more detailed picture of what is happening. And again, we see that we have an increase of the leeward peak and then a decrease in the active particles that are the field symbols. While if here we consider passive particles, we see no dependence from the flow velocity. So we always end up, they always end up in the windward side. 
and at some point passive particle active particle tends to the passive particle limit we can see here a very good agreement between experiment and simulation showing that our model is really capturing the relevant phenomenon at play in the system so to sum up bacteria motility and flow can enhance uh, uh, can create uh, preferential attachment location but there is a, another ingredient we did not consider so far that is bacterial shape um, only elongated cell can produce the leeward peak if a cell is a just spher spherical it will end up in the windward side of a pillar different surface different bacteria we can see the main effect what is important is that we have an eye shear region close to a curved surface. And basically this shear region deflects elongated motile cell and bring them in touch with the, wind, with the leeward side of the surface that in this case, again, we can see that flow is directed in this way and then bacteria end up in the opposite surface. In this case, experiments were run with E. coli so quite different, quite a bit different elongation while quite different swimming speed. Something quite interesting is that the process of shear induced orientation that leads to leeward attachment depends on two bacterial phenotypes. So shape we have seen and motility. Um, a direct consequence of this dependence is a potential niche differentiation of bacterial species having different phenotype. For example, for a given surface geometry and flow velocity, bacteria with different shape and with different motility, like for example these two, could end up in a different location. Here we were considering an elongated bacteria with this uh, swimming speed and a spherical bacteria not motile, could, could for example be Staphylococcus. And we can see that the non-motile spherical bacterium ends up in the windward side, while just the elongated one can cross the surface and end up in the leeward side. And these, like, uh, very different surface colonization is a very important seeding for the future biofilm de development because species that then we will see uh, growing biofilm in a separated fashion can just be uh, driven by the flow to stay separated at the beginning and then develop accordingly. Um, in order to mimic more real and complex surfaces, we increase the, the complexity of the curvature. And uh, here maybe experimental data are more noisy due, due to the increased complexity. However, what we can see is that we have hotspot of colonization behind the apexes. So again, leeward um, peaks. And uh, these like correspond very well between uh, experiments and simulation. So in summary, we can see how we have seen how fluid flow affects the transport of motile bacteria. And we have seen that bacteria motility affects both capture location and efficiency. The coupling of flow with curved geometry induces this like preferential leeward attachment and this leeward attachment can lead to spatial segregation of bacteria with different phenotypes. All this work was done like in 2D geometries, considering like just the surface. However, similar results can be extended in 3D. And we did so by studying bacteria surface colonization of a sinking particle. Sinking spheres are found in different settings like inkjet printing and cloud formation, and they are very often found in the ocean, where they are called marine snow. Marine snow particles are formed by organic detritus, and they are continuously sinking, as we can see in the movie, from uh, oceanics. And if we zoom in one of these particles, 
we will see that they have approximately a spherical shape and their dimension ranks from micron uh, to uh, tens of micron to millimeter. They are very important because they are marine snoiders responsible for the biological pump, that is the vertical flux of carbon from the upper ocean to the depth. And basically, marine snow is the way we have like carbon and so life in the depths of the ocean. However, while thinking these particles are colonized by bacteria that degrade them. And so basically the carbon is still solubilized. Understanding this process of colonization while thinking is very important for the consequences on the biological pump. And so my colleague Jonas recently led the effort in studying analytically and with numerical simulation the encounter rate between sinking particles with the dimension of tens to hundreds of micron and non-motile and motile organisms. What he did again was like modeling these particles as falling spheres and including the impact of shear on the bacterial trajectories and modeling bacteria as a self-propelled ellipsoid with different elongations. Here we can see that in each point around the spheres, we will have some bacteria eating the surface and some bacteria missing the surface. This depends on their initial orientation. What we can already see here is that, again, some bacteria end up in the leeward. And uh, this was described in terms of encounter probability. And uh, with the case of the perfect sphere, we could see that while going deeper, so like while sinking, the particle was mainly colonized by bacteria in the windward, if they were spherical, while if we had perfect rods, they were ending up again in the leeward as we saw in the previous case. So again, very different geometry. In one case, we had 2D, in the other 3D, but very, very similar results. Um, with the same like model, we are trying to extend the pillar case from 2D through 3D, um, because the interest there would be seeing the combined effect on the pillar of the surfaces of the uh, both also top and bottom surface. So, so far, we have been analyzing how flow impacts the bacterial distribution in flow and the bacterial distribution on surfaces. Now, as a last topic, I would like to um, present you the opposite, like to show you how the bacteria suspension can influence the flow field. And this was like a work I did during my PhD with the concentrated bacteria suspension. Here we took a bacillus subtilis concentrated suspension. As we uh, can see, um, the concentrated suspension create collective pattern due to hydrodynamic interaction and steric collision. This was discussed also by the last uh, presenters. And uh, if we look at the flow field uh, created by this uh, concentrated suspension, we can see that we have vortices and jets in the uh, creating something like a turbulent velocity field. However, um, we could ask ourselves, is the bioturbulence just looking like real turbulence, classical turbulence, or is there a deeper similarity? In this case, we decided to use flow to inquire into the nature of bioturbulence. And to do so, we took a microfluidic channel where a parabolic flow profile was developed in the mid plane of the channel, that was our observation plane. And we took like our dense suspension of bisaptilis and started flowing it. The flow field generated by bacteria suspension was measured with a technique called the Gauss particle velocimetry. That is a velocimetry technique that allows basically um, the use of tracers smaller than the resolution of the microscope, uh, exploiting interference. And those are like polystyrene particles flowing. And we can see that we can follow the speckle pattern they create. 
thanks to this, this technique, we could reconstruct the velocity field in the observation plane created by the motile suspension of uh, concentrated suspension. And we could observe a very puzzling phenomena. We could observe a very strong intermittency in the um, velocity u. And uh, this like intermittency was like related to a change in the cross stream profile. So we can see that we have fast region and slow region in green. If we take the velocity, the flow profile in the uh, fast region, we see a shape that is more than parabolic. The gray one is the ideal parabolic flow we would get with like polystyrene particles, for example, in our geometry. And we can see that is more peaked in this case. While in the green part, the slow one, we see a plug flow. And uh, if we now take a non-motile suspension by just killing the alive suspension, we see that basically the plug flow profile will be very nicely reproduced. And so we have like an alive behavior and a non-motile behavior here in the same profile and they keep switching. And this is what we called intermittency. We can flow the, our suspension at different flow velocity and we can see that intermittency is present only if we apply a low velocity as we can see here looking at the different profile in times. As we increase the velocity this heterogeneity in the flow profile disappears until we have something that is quite stable. If we now look at the profile, what we see is that also the deviation from the parabolic ideal profile that we see at low shear, at high shear basically disappears, and uh, motile in black and non -mot um, in red, sorry, and non motile in black suspension basically behave the same and are really close to the ideal parabolic profile we should get in our geometry. So since we wanted to compare this bioturbulence with the classical turbulence, what we did is uh, decomposing the velocity field in like a time averaged component and a fluctuating component. And from the fluctuating component, we could, we could compute the turbulence intensity. Now, if we look at the turbulence intensity in the channel, this is a turbulence intensity field, like just the magnitude, we just see the, that the heterogeneity, a strong heterogeneity in the intensity and a variation in time of the different structures that are formed. Now, if we also look at the direction of the turbulence intensity, we can see jets and uh, uh, vortices as we would expect in the normal turbulence. Again, in classical turbulence, Velocity correlation functions are used to detect the presence of vortex structures. And this is the shape that we would expect in classical turbulence for the longitudinal and the transversal velocity correlation function. If we now look at what we get in our system, we see that basically the shape is really, really similar. And so the vortices we were seeing by light are really visible also in the correlation function. In addition, if we now analyze the velocity field and we see, we can see that when we have a parabolic pro profile in the turbulence intensity, we have an higher value. And also if we look at the direction of the turbulence intensity, we will see that there we have a coherent structure that can be a jet or a vortex. So this is very interesting because it's telling us that basically the activity and the capability of creating vortices and structures is the driving uh, uh, motor of the fluctuation and of the intermittency phenomenon. Now, pushing again uh, forward the comparison with classical turbulence, we calculated the stress tensor which characterizes the effect of velocity fluctuation on the mean flow profile. And the, the stress tensor is defined like that. And the first term 
is the Reynolds stress. This term is due to the transport of fluid elements in the direction transversal to the flow. And this is what in the classical turbulence causes an increase in the viscosity. We can see that in our system, when we have a motile uh, sample, a motile suspension, the Reynolds stress is non-zero, like we would expect in classical turbulence, while it's zero if uh, the suspension is non-motile. Then, if we consider the sign of the two um, elements, of the two parts of the stress tensors, we see that in our case, the sign is discordant. And this is different, this is the opposite from the classical turbulence, because in the classical turbulence, normally they have the same sign. And uh, this basically tells that the Reynolds stress is causing an increase in the viscosity of the suspension. While in our case, the fact that the sign is discordant means that the Reynolds stress is causing a decrease in the viscosity. And this means that bacteria are pushing the fluid and injecting energy from the small bacterial scale to the large scale of the flow by creating the vortices and uh, interacting among each other. And this basically is a reverse energy cascade if compared with the one that we can find in the classical turbulence, because in that case, we have an injection of energy at the small, at the big scale in a pipe flow, and then we have a dissipation of energy due to the vortices at the micron scale, while here is the opposite. We have a micrometric self-propelled objects that are basically steering the fluid and pushing it. This effect of steering and pushing that bacteria are performing can also be seen if we uh, consider the viscosity, because motility and activity induces a decrease in the viscosity of the suspension. And we see that by directly comparing the viscosity of a non-motile and a motile suspension, in a viscosimeter on a chip. Basically, this device is very simple. We flow an active and a, a motile and a non-motile suspension, and we see where the interface is located. And basically, what we can see here, we can also use different velocity and study this effect at different shear. And what we can see is that at very low shear, the non-motile suspension is way more viscous than the motile one. And then this difference is like reduced at increasing shear. Meaning that again, as in the previous case of the pillar, uh, motility of the, the motility of the suspension and the effect of bacterial activity is very, very evident when the flow velocity is close to their swimming speed. Well then, when the transport is like faster, way faster than their swimming speed, they start behaving as passive particles and in this case as a non-motile suspension. And so this uh, more macroscopic phenomenon of the decrease in viscosity was again underlining how important the, were the vortex structure generated by bacterial activity to lower the viscosity, and uh, this is the opposite of what happens in classical turbulence, because where the vortices are like dissipating energy. And so we, we could really conclude here that the bioturbulence bear a strong similarity with the intermittency observed at the onset of classical turbulence in pipe flow. However, here we have a reversed energy cascade due to the interplay between bacteria motility and flow. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, thank my group here, and then all the people that were involved in the work I just presented. If you, I will be now happy to take questions, and if you want to get in touch with me or you are curious about my research, please reach out or check our website. Thank you.